We're very pleased to have uh, Scott Peters here from uh, Rochester and uh, looking forward to his talk. Uh, I wanted to just give Dean Shipley uh, a moment just to welcome you guys here and then uh, I'll do a little presentation on SMART so you guys know what uh, we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll have Scott uh, give, uh, give our presentation. Good morning. I am um, genetically adverse to content-free introductions, but I can't help myself this morning. I'm just going to say welcome. I'm really glad you're here and you're pleased as a school of architecture and planning to be part of the family of, of, of the sustainable manufacturing and advanced robotics center of excellence, or communities of excellence. I do want to suggest that we are pretty dedicated to the idea that collectively what we see in SMART is a kind of a consolidation, uh, integration of engineering, of, of design, materials, innovation, of architecture, of the construction industry, uh, a way of thinking about making through robotics, um, uh, and about sustainability. And the premise is that no one of us has got all of that in our bag, but we've found ways collectively to do things together we can't do by ourselves. And um, I'll be frank, we're new in this game. Architects have always imagined they were interdisciplinary. I suspect engineers have too, but I think the reality is we haven't. And uh, so we're, we're learning as we go for the design community that we are close to in architecture, this is a tremendous way of thinking. It is a new media with which we can paint. And I don't speak to architects painting as if that was a kind of, we are just artists. We understand from our Design Future Society, for example, which is a group where mostly architects, some engineers hang out from time to time that the least efficient industry in the world is construction. Um, we have a social obligation and a responsibility to those who engage us in our professions to address that problem and with the best positive uh, social and business outcomes we can. So carry on and thank you very much for being here and letting us play. Smart is probably something quite new. Uh, we have been now, you know, we're one of three um, of the communities of excellence, and uh, our focus is on sustainable manufacturing and advanced robotic technologies. We have 40 plus faculty from five different schools engineering, architecture, and planning, um, management, arts and sciences, and graduate school of education. Uh, now, SMART's mission is really tied to what we are seeing happening um, in the manufacturing industry in the U.S., uh, the, uh, the, the loss of the U.S. manufacturing base and advanced technology products has exposed us to a, a fundamental need to rethink how we're uh, giving scientific knowledge as well as uh, uh, promoting uh, education that focuses on turning that trend around. And SMART's focus, in many ways, is, focus, it is tied to the National Academy's challenges on manufacturing, uh, which include um, reducing the production waste and product of, uh, of environmental, fact, uh, environmental impact to near zero, reconfiguring manufacturing enterprise rapidly in response to the changing needs, achieving concurrency in all operations, uh, processes um, uh, and, and products across scales, instantaneously transforming information gathered from a vast uh, array of sources into useful knowledge for making effective decisions, innovative and smart materials, and probably uh, one of the more interesting things that uh, tie us also uh, uh, and, and keep us in, in uh, consideration as to why we also play a role, the human-machine collaboration, 
uh, integrating human and technical resource to enhance the workforce performance and satisfaction. Now these uh, criteria, in terms of responding to such a criteria, uh, we do have a grand challenge that's tied to it. And this is what SMART uh, is focused on to develop advanced materials, technologies, and processes that enable uh, the sustainable, data-driven, cost-effective production of high-quality, customizable products. That's a math load. Uh, but I think uh, what, what we're increasingly realizing is that the question of efficiency is not enough in this, uh, or, or automation. It really is a kind of holistic view of what does sustainability mean, what does this world of information technologies, which is really uh, what Industry 4.0 is about, uh, this, this uh, confluence of uh, information technology with industry where the factory, production, and construction processes self-govern, and the analytics and data science capture multi-scale behaviors. Um, there is uh, topics, uh, research focus within SMART uh, is around these uh, few areas, humans in the loop, which looks to integrate human and technical resources to enhance workforce performance, Data-enabled fa fabrication, this seeks to transform information gathered from a vast array of sources of useful knowledge. Sustainable design, which is to explore ways to reduce production waste um, and product in, uh, environmental impacts to near zero. Uh, advanced manufacturing and uh, production robotics, this is to reconfigure manufacturing enterprises rapidly in response to changing needs and opportunities. And then finally, materials innovation, and which looks to develop innovative materials, manufacturing processes, and products at cross scale. Now, one would imagine that some of these topics, you know, reside in a single discipline, and that's, I think, where we uh, realize uh, is the fallacy uh, that none of these topics uh, can uh, uh, be isolated in any particular way, and so. Uh, the fact that we have the engineering sciences, that the School of Engineering, uh, the School of um, uh, Arts and Sciences, School of Management, and School of Architecture and Planning tied to all of these things uh, uh, proves that, that, that this holistic view, uh, at least what SMART is trying to construct, holistic view of, of these things allows us to not only be looking towards innovation, but also the human consequences of human uh, Now the community's vision uh, at, is, is organized around basically three general areas, education, engagement, and scholarship. Um, this is what's nice about these communities. They're not simply about just research. They really look at uh, our responsibility to the students in terms of how we educate them also to our region and our, um, our industry, so this is where engagement comes in. Uh, and then finally to scholarship or research, which is uh, predominantly where uh, you know, our focus tends to be. And and, and so, Across these samples, we, we have been slowly uh, developing um, you know, new agendas. Uh, I think you know, with, with engagement is sort of where, uh, since we are in the School of Architecture, I'll sort of focus a little bit on engagement because that's sort of been our focus. How do we now make partnerships with industry and actually do research, but also education uh, tied to that? Um, education in and of itself means new kinds of programs, perhaps across these disciplines. Uh, certain kinds of degrees in advanced manufacturing that could uh, incorporate not having, you know, only being an engineer, but you could be an architect, an engineer, or even somebody for management. Uh, the other things are some assets that we have in terms of real estate, which is wonderful to have when you're doing this kind of uh, research work. Uh, up in, in uh, on the North Campus in Bonner, we have a research space, but we also have a uh, space in Furnace. Uh, there's, there's room there to do research, but also to do teaching. Uh, uh, down here on, uh, in Parker Hall, we are in the process of putting the space together. Uh, that space hopefully will be online uh, by next fall. Uh, there, the focus is on large-scale building, so we're looking at uh, 
water jets, laser uh, cutters, as well as robot arms um, uh, and kilns. And then maybe I just might just highlight uh, as, as, as a close of uh, some research that is going on at the present. Um, we are working with uh, a few partners here, uh, Rich Dives Metals as well as Simex, uh, Dr. P, uh, working on innovative use of thin gauge metals uh, for architectural scale structures, also the use of robotic construction for dry stack portable compressive structures built with elements that do not require mortar or fasteners. And these projects are not simply just housed here. We are working with our colleagues in engineering uh, as well as our manufacturing uh, uh, collaborators. Another collaborator is Boston Valley Terracotta, who we are doing uh, uh, two levels of engagement with. One is at the level of um, uh, working on innovative design uh, uh, focused on bioclimatic performances of surrounding building assemblies. And then on the other side, every year we hold, uh, host a ceramic assembly workshop that brings uh, people from the industry here uh, for five days uh, that uh, uh, brings uh, building professionals, structural engineers, architects, as well as artists and ceramics uh, uh, and ceramic engineers. So that will take place in August of uh, this year as it did last year. There's also uh, 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 innovative work and um, some work that we hopefully will be doing in terms of collaboration with, uh, with Scott's group at Construction Robotics. This is uh, uh, two projects that are also going on right now. Jim Young Sung is working on the zero energy adaptive facade. Uh, the interest of robotics within the building industry in terms of uh, adaptable architecture and then also the, the thought of, that Mike Silver <coughs> is looking into on uh, co-robotics, the use of robots as a, uh, 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 not as just a tool, but as a kind of assistant within the construction industry doing masonry work. Okay. So there, there, there have been a few highlights that I just want to uh, 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 pull out in terms of research and scholarship from SMART. Uh, we are a, a tier one member in the Digital Manufacturing uh, and Design Innovation Institute, uh, DMDI, uh, and is and part of the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. This allows us to go for granting uh, uh, on uh, uh, larger granting on uh, areas that are, I think are of uh, uh, significant importance for, uh, for our researchers. Uh, we've also um, been involved in uh, four DMDI submissions. And uh, we, we continue to look, and these are uh, partners, we continue looking to collaborate uh, on large scale projects uh, outside of DMDI as well as you know, other uh, projects potentially for NSF granting. In terms of uh, educational outcomes, that's I think an important thing for the group of students in the back there is to maybe start thinking a little bit about uh, things uh, maybe removed from your basic uh, disciplines. Uh, so advanced graduate certificate in advanced manufacturing has been approved. Uh, that may be an interest of some people. There's a minor in manufacturing now at UB. Uh, there is the sandbox that has been in Bonner Hall that's constructed. They're going to be holding um, uh, certain uh, uh, events there in terms of education events. And then I did mention the Advanced Ceramics uh, Assembly Workshop that we will do in August here. So if you are interested in any of these, uh, do let me know. I can sort of put you in touch with the right people. And then finally, uh, we're, what we're doing in terms of community outreach and, and outreach for engagement. Uh, these smart talks, which is uh, now I think we're the, the third one, the fourth one, the fourth talk, which uh, Scott will be giving, and this is a hope to try to bring industry in to, to give talks, to show what they're doing, and to start creating certain kinds of alliances in terms of uh, research, uh, internships, other kinds of things like that. We are also working with BMW downtown, um, and the School of uh, Engineering is to, to develop this uh, uh, professor of practice position, which I believe will be in place pretty soon. Um, there, here at the school, I, like I uh, emphasized, we're very focused on working with industry, so these are some of our partners, Simex, Georgia Pacific, Construction Robotics, 
automated diamond embossed uh, rigid axe metals. These are industries that we've now been um, uh, fostering long-term relationships with over the last few years. And then finally, there's plans for UB Inc. to partner with the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. I think this is another interesting outcome to help students maybe move towards more entrepreneurial uh, endeavors um, and think of their education in ways to um, start up uh, uh, innovative new um, uh, firms like Scott's is, uh, uh, which incorporate uh, your education but also partner with other people uh, to bring um, innovative ideas uh, 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 to the industry. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Mike Silver, who will introduce our speaker for today. So um, I'll be really brief because I really want you guys to um, see the amazing work that uh, Constructor Robotics is doing. Um, clearly, there's a paradigm shift in digital fabrication and architecture happening from desktop manufacturing and uh, CNC building, laser cutting, you know, all those tools to think about robotics in, on the, in the construction site. It's a very difficult problem and it's being tackled around the world by different uh, schools. One, of course, you might know ETH has done a lot of research, which has done a lot of uh, brick stacking robots uh, for, and even put them on tracks to go into the job site. But we have here construction robotics, which is way ahead of the curve here. They have a product in the market. It's not experimental. They're actually implementing this tool in the field. Um, and they, uh, when I first uh, met Scott in DC, we were giving a lecture to unions. Um, I was amazed because they solved the mortar problem, how the machine deploys the mortar. And that was to me like a mind blowing moment and led uh, to uh, bringing Scott into um, SMART. So I'm not going to talk much more, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott uh, from Construction Robotics. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Mike, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's, it's incredibly exciting uh, to be here in Buffalo to be able to talk to uh, a group of like-minded people, you know, in the architecture space, the engineering space, and really this idea of, of bringing these worlds together um, for, I think, what is going to be the future of, of construction, of building things, of digital fabrication. And, uh, you know, that whole concept, the whole mindset is really what drove the start of our company, Construction Robotics. So, um, again, thrilled to be here. It's a pretty exciting time, I think, to be an engineer and, and to be uh, out there in the world of building things. So, so I'm going to give a little history here. Uh, the company was founded a number of years ago by myself and my business partner, uh, Nate Podkaminer. Uh, on the engineering side, he was really the architecture and construction side, uh, architecture by training and uh, spent his whole career building things uh, out in Syracuse as a general contractor. And so I think when we got together uh, about 10 years ago now and started talking about how things were done in construction and how things were done in the manufacturing world, we realized there was this massive gap. You know, when you're building buildings, they show up and drop a bunch of parts on the ground and say, put it together. And in the manufacturing space over the last 10, 15 years, they've really and, and really longer, you know, they've evolved. They've been able to implement robotics. They've been able to implement pre-assemblies and things that really uh, have increased the efficiency of manufacturing orders of magnitude. But, and, and when you look at construction, it is one of the most, if not the, it is the most inefficient uh, industry out there. So the opportunity was, was ripe for the picking. And we formed this company with the vision of developing uh, affordable leading edge robotic and automation equipment for the construction industry. So we're more than just a bricklaying robot. We're developing other products. We will be developing other products in the construction space. Um, we have partnerships with, with general contractors and others to actual bring, actually bring um, robots and other applications within construction. But our first product is, is this uh, uh, robot that we call SAM for semi-automated mason. And, and we'll spend a lot more time talking about SAM. So a little bit of a, of a timeline and history. You know, we started with the concept about 10 years ago. But it was about 2012. We actually formed, really formed the company, hired some engineers, and started playing with this uh, idea. We built our first prototype in 2013 as part of uh, a National Science Foundation and NSF SBIR grant that we received, um, and built our first prototype and, and demonstrated it in uh, Victor, New York, on a, on a small building. And that was exciting because we showed that we could mortar the bricks and, and put them in the wall. We showed that we could get the right quality, um, but it was also um, 
eye-opening because there was many, many challenges that really needed to be solved to create a practical tool that could be purchased and operated by Masons. So about a year later, um, one year, in one year we had totally redesigned, we came off the job site, Victor, we totally redesigned everything on the machine, um, kept some of the core technology, but we redesigned everything and we were back on a job site in the fall of 2014. And over the, the course of the following year and a half, you know, we continued through our SBIR program and uh, you know, grew our business, but uh, mo much of what we did over the following year and a half from 2014, 15, and into early 2016 was really just demonstrating and learning. So we would bring our robot to a job site, we would run it, we lay a few bricks, we learn. We'd hear from Masons, we'd hear about what we need to do to make it more efficient, but for the most part, it was our engineers running these, these robots. And in 2016, we really went through a major transition as a company, which is, which is pretty exciting. We, uh, we sold our first couple of machines in 2016, brought on a distributor, and we started rolling out a training program. We started to educate Masons on how to run the machine. We, we were able to improve much of our software, much of our technology, and we more than doubled our production speed on a job site. And we went through all these transitions that now have made the robot, I think, significantly more appealing uh, from, a, from a purchase or rental standpoint for the Masons in the field, um, which really makes it a reality of a, of a usable tool for the Masons, but we also have started to put this in the hands of Masons. So now people in the field, and I'll talk more about this, but these guys that have spent, their, these people that have spent their, their whole careers uh, as craftsmen, working with their hands, working with stone and brick, um, now are operating robots and controlling them and are excited about it, which is really cool to see because I think it's the start of where construction is going in the future. Um, and you'll see it in a few other spaces. You'll start to see it in areas where you get, um, you know, uh, machine control of your of your dozer blades and things like that, and you start to see like spots where uh, robots and robotics and automation are starting to find their way on the job sites. And I think this is just a really uh, you know what we produce is a really fun and exciting example of, of where the future is, is going and, and the fact that it's it's actually here today. Um, so the problem that that really started this whole thing is is uh, is we looked at how construction was backwards. Um, there was many challenges that construction has faced over the last five or ten years, and a lot of that is starting to come to a head today. You look at labor shortages, you look at some of the challenges of skilled craftspeople, and, and how do we get more people into the industry? Um, not to mention, when you look at masonry and other aspects of construction, it's incredibly um, physically demanding, so the rate of injuries is very high, uh, which makes it even more challenging, I think, to, to retain people in the industry. So the, there are many challenges that this industry faces. If you look at if you look at this uh, this gap that is occurring between uh, the demand for for skilled trades, in particular in masonry, and actual employment, you know, in 2008 9 there was a huge drop in employment because there was a recession and construction slowed down. Well, now as things started, it started to come back as there's demand. The number of masons coming back into the field is is lower than it's ever been. And so recruitment has become one of the most common discussions. In, in the construction industry. So we have this major skills gap now that is occurring. So how, how, do we, how do we recruit people? How do we get more skilled trades in the construction industry so we can keep building things? And it, it, the answer is not in the short term anyways. You know, these, you know, you're not gonna drop a 3D printer and fully automate construction. I mean, that's the future of where things are going, but the, the problem is here today. We need solutions that are gonna actually solve problems today. So, you know, if this is the next generation workforce, how do we develop products that is appealing and exciting for them to work with? You guys probably all uh, know FIRST and maybe some of you have participated in FIRST when you were in high school, but it's, it's really a, an exciting program at the high school level where kids are starting to play with robots. They're starting to get excited about robotics in, in many different ways. And, and robotics can mean everything from you know, remote control little devices to you know, more semi-automated to even fully automated devices. You know, it can mean a lot of different things, but you know, how do we engage these, the, the future industry? and uh, solve these issues. And uh, when you start to think about digital fabrication and the direction that construction is going, you know, we, we think about BIM, right? So how do we get better models? How do we really pull um, the design side of, of uh, construction to a higher level? When you look at manufacturing, uh, that was one of the major shifts that manufacturing was able to go through, is that they, they were able to drive a much higher level of design, which enabled a much stronger um, uh, implementation in the fabrication side. But then there's also robotics, and as we talk about robots, as we, uh, as I go out there and, and introduce robotics, a lot of people think 
of manufacturing and robots in this type of format. You got a, a bunch of robots doing a very repetitive task in a very controlled environment. Everything is guarded, everything is confined, and it's a very known, uh, and you have known inputs, you have known outputs. Construction is not that situation. Real life construction is probably the opposite of that situation. So um, the future of where robotics are going is this concept of collaborative robots. How do we start to work more closely with the robots so that they're not just in this defined space um, where you, know, you have to control everything very precisely? Well, robots are getting smarter, technology is improving, and the future of robotics is becoming more and more collaborative. So how do we put a robot right next to a worker help take some of the heavy lifting, help increase the productivity, and help augment even some of the capability of the worker there so that robots can, can couple with the, the workforce we have and the future workforce to make everyone more efficient, to make the whole process more efficient. So a lot of this thought process is really what drove SAM, what drove the development of SAM. So this is our semi-automated Mason, and uh, I've got uh, a few videos here of SAM working if you haven't seen it. But uh, SAM works collaboratively uh, with the masons. You get very consistent production. Uh, picks a brick, you can see, applies the mortar to the brick, and then uh, puts it in the wall. So it takes some of that repetitive task out of laying bricks. Um, when you look at masonry in general, uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's heavy lifting, and it's very repetitive, and it's fairly pre predictable. So when you put up a brick veneer, you're putting up each individual small unit. And so how do we, you know, I think that robots are a perfect application of how we can make that more efficient. Um, so when the, the bricks fall into the table, and you'll see more videos as, as I go on here, but as bricks fall onto the table, we measure every single brick. We measure the width of the brick, the height of the brick, and um, we know much more information about uh, the overall process. Uh, we then apply the mortar to the brick, and then it goes in a wall in an exact location. So now, if we start to understand the location of every single brick, we start to understand more about the raw materials that we're putting into the wall, what can we start to do with that, that information, and how is that going to evolve? How is that going to enable different design, different thinking and implementation, um, and different thinking in how, how we uh, progress? So, um, so the other piece of this, as it relates uh, probably more so to architecture and to uh, building design and, and, um, and really how, how we transition from this whole concept of design to actual fabrication is, is uh, you know, the building information modeling world. Uh, typically architects are working in the, in the Revit space or in 3D modeling of their buildings. Um, and so we've had to develop this whole map software this whole interface between actual fabrication. You know, today, when you design something, you go, they get the guys in the field, the masons, they're getting construction documents, often printed construction documents, or just now starting to get um, 2D documents on iPads and things like that. But how, how do we start to get better information? Because for the robot, in order to lay bricks, it has to have a machine, uh, it has to have known locations in space. It has to be able to, to have a map of the space in the building and be able to put bricks exactly where they're supposed to go. So I, one of the things that we've had to really drive and, and develop is this interface between the design world, which is to a certain level of design, which is typically taken and you know, a, a person will understand it, interpret it, and then uh, uh, implement it, to a level of detail where every single brick has a location in space and has, a known, has known information about it. So now the robot has everything it needs to be able to build that wall. Um, and that will help enable, as we as we've talked in the industry, I think what we've realized is that will not only enable robots, uh, but it will also start to enable, I think, more efficient uh, fabrication by, by people. Um, when you get into complex designs, uh, in particular, even with just uh, brick veneers, you get into complex pier patterns and things like that, and you're dealing with dimensions that are non-standard because of variations in build, um, you end up in a situation where it's complex for the mason, which slows them down. So as we get better information into the field, we're going to see efficiencies increase not only of the men, but, but obviously uh, of the robotic uh, with men. So we've developed this brick mapping software. We see it as a tool for architects uh, where they will be able to uh, lay out masonry walls easily, more easily. They'll actually be able to start at complex, at complex patterns, and I'll touch more on that. Um, this whole concept of digital fabrication, how we can leverage um, bricks like pixels on a screen, and our vision for where, where we hope that uh, masonry can go, and, and, and then obviously you know, masonry is just the start, brick veneers are just the start, uh, but it's a, it's a great segue to, I think, where the future of construction will go. 
Uh, and then for, for Mason, what we found is that this tool has actually been very useful for them. From a wall layout standpoint, they can actually lay out uh, masonry details. When you're designing a brick facade, they can actually lay out the details of the bond pattern and control joint locations and everything based on field dimensions, which allows them to do better pre-planning and execute more successfully in the field. So it, it starts with this uh, wall map. The use of SAM starts with the wall map. You have to create the recipe. You have to know where all of your bricks are going. And then you load the machine on the scaffold. Here's a typical mass climbing work platform that the robot works on. Uh, there's the robot there, SAM 100, and it's loaded on, on the scaffold uh, with uh, a fork truck. And so this is a, a video that should give you a little bit of bigger picture. So this is a job that we're on. Uh, actually, we're, we're just wrapping up now out in Indianapolis uh, with a customer, a large customer out there. And uh, you can see here's, here's uh, Sam, the robot, on the scaffold. This is about a 100-foot sectional wall. Typically, on a 100-foot sectional wall, you might have four to six masons and two or three laborers supporting that. Uh, the crew that's working with this is two masons and a laborer. Um, they might have a, a third mason up there at various times working on some other manual aspects of the wall. Um, but as you can see, th there's a lot more going on on these job sites than just this robot lane break. So there's a much bigger picture that needs to be understood. And that's in the, in the implementation of SAM, that's been one of the biggest learnings that we've had. And it's been one of the biggest focuses of our training program. Because the actual implementation of robot, robots in the field really comes down to how they utilize it. So how, you know, it's a, it's a robot and it's running at 350 to 400 bricks per hour or it's running at zero. So men are very flexible, they're very dynamic. I need to move somebody from here to there, I can do that. They need to work really, really fast, they can do that. But over the course of a day, their, produ their overall production is, is, is uh, typically in the range of three to 500 bricks per man because there's a lot of things going on, you physically get exhausted, you have to stop to think. There's all these things that happen. With the robot, when you're laying bricks, you're running at 350 to 400 bricks per hour consistently when you're running. So you can, you're talking about an uh, order of magnitude increase of, of three, to, three to six X um, at least in productivity. But it's about keeping the robot running. So with this crew of two masons and a laborer, you start to get a feel. Your mason's able to put blue board in, they're able to drill their, their uh, wall tie or their brick ties into the wall um, and, and work other aspects of that masonry facade while the robot continues in the background to pick bricks, line mortar to it, and put it in the wall. And while that's happening, they're feeding it with mortar, they're monitoring the machine, and they're doing other things. But as if they stop to think, if they stop to shoot the breeze about the thing they did last night, bricks are still going in the wall. Uh, production is still happening. And this is what is going to enable more efficient operation. And this crew right here that you see, you know, they, their best day uh, out on, the, on these walls was in the range of 3,000 bricks. So they're averaging between two and 3,000 bricks per day. Uh, on, on some of these walls. And in a day where they're laying you know, 2,500 or 3,000 bricks with these guys, uh, typically if they were running without the robot there, they're gonna get somewhere around 1,000 bricks you know, on a good day, maybe a little less, maybe a little more on, on their best days. You know, so you're talking 3x productivity uh, easily, and you can see the pace of operation is very comfortable. These guys like working with the robot, they enjoy it. It's, uh, it's something that it's, it's just part of, now it's become part of their, their regular operation. The laborer, he's able to tend for the amount of production of three to five, uh, or of uh, you know four to six guys, masons on the wall, which really uh, increases the efficiency of that guy as well, feeding the robot in the way that he's feeding a, a single machine, loading it with mortar, loading it with bricks. So you start to get a feel for how the robot integrates into the overall job site. But that was one of the, the core learnings and, and uh, focuses that we had out of the gate. When we started to think about developing a robot for the job site, it had to be flexible, it had to be easy to implement for the masons, it had to be useful by the masons, and it had to be a product that we could actually bring to market and sell and, and find useful today. As a startup company, um, you know, we've been fortunate to have some research grants, but we, we need to have, be able to have a product that's useful for the industry so that we can grow and, and really uh, uh, you know, evolve as a, as a company. So the big focus was, was how do we make a useful product today? And so, this is uh, Sam in action. So the other thing that really is pretty interesting that's evolved over time is that we start to get more information. We start to get more data from the job site. So we now have a website where, as the robot's running, every few minutes you're getting updates pushed to the cloud, and so you're, you're, it, it's actually a part of the, you know, this whole idea of uh, the Internet of Things, you know, the really connected devices where these machines are talking to the cloud, and, and they're 
they're now providing better information to the foreman, the, the masonry superintendent, the people in the shop, so they can start to understand their schedules better, they can start to understand uh, results in the job site. And right now, this is just obviously masonry uh, veneers and the bricks they're installing, but this is the future of construction. There's more information. If construction is going to be more efficient, they need more information from the field. They need to understand uh, where, they're, where they're falling down from an efficiency standpoint, where their schedules are behind or where they're, where they're able to gain. So th this has been a really valuable and important tool. And in addition, we start to get more information about every single unit in that wall. So for example, that brick right there, I know it was brick 3,144, and it was laid on, uh, on uh, 825 of 2015, at that exact time, what the exact temperature was, the humidity, and all this information about that individual brick. So uh, we have no idea what is actually going to be uh, this information is going to be used for, but it's fun for a bunch of engineers to think about and uh, and start to provide and log that data because the future of construction again is the more information. Same thing with manufacturing. The more information you have, the more information you have up front, the more information you have on the back end more efficient, the more, um, you know, the better product, the better result that you can actually provide. So this is part of what just kind of comes free as we start to uh, implement machines and, and robots on the job site. And so the vision of where all of this is going really uh, ties back to um, this, uh, this idea of, of digital design coupled with um, uh, robotic fabrication. And so uh, this is a quote from one of our customers in, uh, in Indiana. So Wilhelm Construction uh, purchased a machine recently. And, uh, it's a big step for us. They're a great customer. And, uh, and one of the reasons why they had a desire, besides the significant increase in production of their crew, is that they really see this as an opportunity to uh, talk to the owners of these buildings, talk to the architecture community, talk to the design community, um, and, and talk about how brick veneer uh, walls can be more cost effective. They can actually get done faster. And they can start to add things like uh, color patterns, corbeline, complex patterns without really slowing production. So now you can start to increase the value add of a brick veneer um, because it's not just a big flat wall that you know has a couple of corbels and maybe a couple of soldier courses in it. It becomes a canvas that, that an architect can use as a feature wall. They can do very interesting and dynamic things with it. And so how do we how do we leverage that information um, to think of future designs and truly leverage what the robot is there for? Sure, it's there for production today. It's built for the mason today, which is why we designed it and how we're able to sell it into the field. But the future of the true benefit of this robot is going to be when we have architects designing buildings with a robot in mind. When they think about the fact that, OK, I know that we are going to use robots to actually build this. So now, how do we best leverage the capability of that robot? In a, in, a most, in the most efficient manner possible. And you can start to think about interesting brick designs. And these are all buildings that, that obviously were built today, not by the robot. But it starts to get you to think about how this can become more commonplace. And many of these buildings probably had uh, unlimited budgets uh, with their masonry veneers. But when you start to think about patterns like that, um, it's a no-brainer for the robot. You know, Things like this, Sam cannot do today, but it will be able to do in the future. As, the, as our technology evolves, as the industry evolves, as it drives more design, you know, things like that, absolutely we can do today. Um, so there are obviously limitations to new technology uh, as it sits today, but, but um, that will evolve, and a lot of that is going to be driven by, I think, the architecture community and what, what type of building facades they want to see and, and the value of, uh, of where that building facade is going. But uh, I think it really, it, it, it hopefully will open up the minds of architects. As we go out there and present to, to uh, people in the industry, I think we want to try to open up their minds, open up their thinking to what, what these robots can, can bring to the table and how brick walls don't just have to be basic brick walls. They can be artwork. They can be something that has an impact. You know, this was a, um, this was a wall we actually built in the shop. This was actually on the Coors Field wall. Um, or Coors Field you know, has an entrance way up in, uh, in Colorado. And uh, we saw this cool little brick pattern on there, so we had uh, just duplicated it one afternoon. We were playing around. We built this, you know, thousand brick panel or whatever in a matter of a few hours with a couple guys. And uh, we were talking actually to the mason who built this out in Colorado, and he was getting like 200 bricks per day with his guys because it was such a complex pattern. Whereas the robots laying a thousand bricks in a matter of a couple hours. So um, again, significantly increased 
capability and, and lower cost, faster installation with the ability to add complex design is really where I think uh, those two couple together can have a big impact. So this is a brief, uh, uh, I guess, demonstration of, of what our software has, has available. Um, but as we start to try to put this in the hands of, of people, um, you know, we're, we're starting to get more and more feedback on this. This will continue to evolve. But the whole concept is, again, um, a piece of software that is designed uh, for masonry in a way that you're actually getting individual brick unit information. You can add complex patterns. Everything's laid out for you on this grid, um, you know, the bond grid um, that is, is really designed for masonry. So the goal is as we implement this into the, the industry as a tool that you can actually um, you know, download and utilize, and, and there will be others out there as well, but the goal is that you'll be able to take masonry design and more easily add complex patterns and do interesting things with masonry design, and it will make uh, laying out masonry as, as simple as, uh, you know, it'll leverage the true capability of software with algorithms and things like that that make main, laying, laying out masonry uh, easy, easy as you can see. You know, to lay out a complex pattern, it, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, and then, what, one thing we've also been able to do is we've started to, uh, to look at how do we digitize images and, and pixelate them and overlay them. And so to a point where you can envision you have this software, you're working in Revit, you're designing a building, you say, hey, I want to make this a feature wall. You click this plugin, this software pops up, allows you to take an image, essentially overlay it on there, move it around, pixelate it, decide the color shading you want, and then boom, you have this now complex wall pattern that, uh, that is implemented. And you can start to think about logos and words. And so this is a, a fun little example um, of how we have actually used this, this uh, so far. So about a year ago, we were talking with a, a customer uh, down in uh, Maryland. This is actually a brick distributor. We talked about the robot and our vision for how it's going to impact the masonry industry. And uh, they, they had a building that they were putting in. Um, had a section left, said, hey, bring the robot down, let's, let's uh, use it to lay bricks, we'll do a little demonstration. So it was about 4,000 utility bricks. Again, uh, a guy will lay about 400 in a day. And uh, so it was about 4,000. We said, we want to run it continuously. Take us about 24 hours to get the, the wall done. Uh, if we did that today, you know, one year later, it'd take us uh, almost half the time to, to do that wall. Um, but uh, you know, we said, OK, we're going to come in, we're going to run it with three crews of masons. And we're just going to get the wall done in one shot. And it's also a very big flat wall. So what if we put your logo in? What if we did something interesting and, and complex to show off the capability of the robots? So we took their logo. We digitized it. We, we laid out a bunch of actual bonds to decide, OK, there's no, no um, cuts narrower than a certain size. And, and we gave them a cut list ahead of time so they were able to pre-cut all the materials. And then um, we, uh, we built the wall. So we set up on one day, did our training, and one day the next day we showed up in the morning and we started, started laying brick. This is a cool little flyover. This is about an 80 foot section of wall. And um, uh, we had a mason and a laborer typically working with us. Sometimes they had a second mason there. And uh, the robot just put bricks in the wall for 24 hours continuous. Just kept putting bricks in the wall, kept putting bricks in the wall. Um, Baker brick by the morning. As you can see there, the, the brick ties are installed by the people, uh, by the men and, and people working on the scaffold. Um, they're loading the bricks, they're loading the mortar. And when you come to an area where the, the pattern was in the, in the facade, where you had a different colored brick that was bumped out, it would ask for that brick to be loaded in the chutes up top. So you'll see on the machine, there's a couple of chute locations where you'll load cut brick, bulk brick gets loaded on the side. So when software pops up and says, hey, I need a six inch brick loaded in chute one, you know, that's the, the lighter colored brick. They pull that brick from their pile of bricks, load it in that chute, the robot then takes it, applies the mortar, puts it in the wall. So it, it really is the instructions that help the men um, put that, that uh, uh, logo in the wall. So over the course of, of the day, you know, there was a lot of visitors and uh, we had a nice little um, picnic out there and just kind of watched the robot install brick and it was a, a really uh, pretty cool Pretty cool experience. And in the end, it ended up saving money, um, got the wall done very quickly, pretty cool looking little logo on the wall on, on their building, and, and it really showed off some of the capabilities of, of what the robot can, can bring to the table. So now I want to touch a little bit on, on uh, working with Sam, what some of the feedback we're getting with the industry, and, and, uh, and show you some of the, the work that we've done with the robot. 
and then uh, I'll kind of open it up for questions. So, uh, uh, here's some quotes of some people that, that we've uh, we've talked about there, and I think that what you see in reading some of these quotes is that there's there's um, some common themes, but but really I think as we've talked to the industry, I think you know the initial fear was, hey, uh, this is a craft industry, this is a, an old school industry, they're not going to be very open to bringing robots on the job site. So as we've been out there giving talks, as we've been out there engaging with people, I think what we've learned is that they understand the, the pain points that the industry is struggling with, with efficiency, with the future of workforce, with how do we how do we do things differently to uh, to really help construction grow and, and enable better architecture design, better buildings. And uh, there's been a, a fairly open um, feeling towards robots, towards the use of robots on job sites. And uh, it's been really exciting for us to, uh, to see that. And we've worked with uh, both union and non-union contractors across the board. Um, in fact, some of our best customers and some of our early sales have been with, with union contractors. So uh, it, it's, been, it's been, I think, eye-opening for us and exciting for us to see the engagement from the construction industry as a whole. Because I think that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we are at this, um, at this inflection point. The construction industry is at this inflection point where something has to be done. And, uh, and you're starting to see more and more technology. We're not the only startup in the space of, of uh, architecture and engineering and construction um, that's trying to provide more efficiency on the job sites. And I think there's going to be a lot more of that here in the near future. Um, but, but as you think about the, the, what they see as the future, um, you know, I think that some of the things that we hear is that, hey, it, really been, it was relatively easy and painless to implement this robot on the job site. You know, we're excited about the future of this because it's not going to re replace our men, but it's going to supplement the existing workforce and hopefully attract more young people in, in, into the industry. Now, instead of having to, you know, recruit people and say, yeah, you're going to just lift and, and place block and brick all day, you not only get to learn the craft aspect of actually building walls and doing detailed work and laying out walls and, and the finishing of, of stone and stuff, but now you get the opportunity to work with technology, work with robots, and take some of the repetitive, um, uh, boring work out of, out of uh, your job. Uh, you know, another, another job, this was a job we were on, where uh, they were, I think, excited about how quickly they were able to learn how to operate the machine. Um, you know, and here, uh, the customer in, uh, in Indiana, I think, really sees the value in the, the, uh, the increased productivity in what, what the robot brings to the table. And uh, again, it's about augmenting the workforce that they have not eliminating the workforce, but how do we make them more efficient and how do we uh, enable a more successful workforce. Um, so over the last few years, just to give you a snapshot of, of some of the jobs that we have done, um, it, it's, been, it's been interesting, it's been exciting, and the rate of acceleration between, say, late 2014 when we first started on jobs to today has been, uh, it's really been exponential. You know, the first year there were a couple jobs and then really things started to to pick up, and in, in 2016, we've done more jobs in the last five months. We've been on more jobs, we've laid more bricks in the last four or five months than we did in the previous two years. And over the next three to four months, we've got more bricks to be laid than we have in the last you know, year. So you start to see this exponential increase and in, in, in open adoption by the industry, which is a pretty exciting uh, to see. But in uh, fall of 2014, this was one of the first jobs we were on. They put a few bricks, but at a much slower pace. Uh, and there were a lot of lessons to be learned about implementing uh, integrating with masons, and it's really about the details of making it easy for them to understand, easy for them to, to run, and easy to, uh, to in integrate into the, the job site. Uh, this was in June of 2016, so about five months later. Um, so we went back after the first job, had to improve a bunch of software, improve a bunch of things on the machine, went back out there, learned a lot more on this job. The machine ran much better, but we learned a heck of a lot about um, integrating the machine into the work into the job site and, and really pre-planning and thinking about the use of robots on a job site and how to how to think about that a little bit differently. This was a job we did in um, DC uh, in August 2015. Um, great example of some of the uh, ability to integrate crews with the robot at a relatively high production rate, and uh, you know they were able to lay. Uh, Norman bricks and uh, stack bond pattern with different colored mortars and some some complexities to the design, and then we uh, did this job with the logo in it, which was a really cool example of continuous production over 24 hours um, and the ability to implement some design. In uh, uh, October 2015, we were actually out here in Amherst uh, working on a project in Buffalo with a local contractor. It turned out to be a beautiful building. Um, 
you know, started as a, as a relatively short rental to try out on a wall. We ended up there for six or eight weeks building most of the, the building actually with them, um, which was a really great experience uh, for us. And then uh, continued, and this is a neat example, you know, here's some windows here with some returns. And some of that is going to be manual work. And this is really where the robot integrates with the map. So they're, they're able to apply some manual bricks right next to the robot while it's laying, laying uh, its normal production. And things like this where you have an in and out pattern. Typically a mason contractor is going to reduce his uh, expected production in that instance, whereas the robot um, flew through that at our highest production rates uh, actually on the job. So um, it really starts to, I think, make it very easy to add, add features like that in the projects at, at high value. Um, this was another project we did out in, uh, in Missouri. Um, great, great project here uh, where they were able to learn very quickly and become very proficient with the machine pretty quickly. And then uh, when we've done everything from the larger projects to even smaller projects. This was a project where we worked with a contractor. They talked to them on a Friday. They said, hey, I've got a project here. Can you be there Monday? And we said, yeah. And we showed up Monday, showed up late, late for, for a couple of days. And, and left, and it was it showed the diversity and flexibility of what the robot um, can do, which is one of the key aspects of actually being able to implement robots successfully on a job site. Job sites are dynamic. You know, you've got weather, you've got people. Things are constantly changing. I have yet to be on a job where the schedule that they gave me when I first talked to them was actually hit. In some cases, we missed by nine months. So um, not surprising in, in uh, a lot of areas, but you've got to be flexible and you've got to deal with the kind of the the, the challenges in the construction industry. Um, but that's a big part of, I think, that we've been able to adopt to and uh, you know, the, 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 both the technology and our process that really had to adopt to. Another, another project in Pennsylvania. And you can see, I mean, we've been on everything from, from fairly small jobs, complex, uh, you know, with window openings. You get a project like this. This is a, a third bond uh, utility brick. And, uh, one of the interesting things on this, the not very tall walls, they were basically building a wall per day with a robot and pick it off the scaffold and move it to the next wall. And um, when, we, when we first, you know, so we jumped from wall to wall to wall, and um, we first laid out this project, we, uh, we started to realize that, you know, with the utility brick, it wasn't really laid out properly, things were off on, things were messed up, so we were able to leverage from our software to work with the guys in the field to actually lay things out and um, dimension things according to uh, the actual field measurements. And we were able to run through a number of scenarios in our software ahead of time of, hey, if I shift the bond pattern here, if I make cuts in this orientation, I can reduce the overall number of cuts on the job site. So that pre-planning allowed everyone to be more efficient. A lot of them would be more efficient when they first laid out the walls, but then once the robot showed up, we knew that it was going to hit the ground running in a, in a very efficient manner. Um, another project down in uh, Mississippi, and then this is um, one of the more recent projects. Uh, started in October, and we're just wrapping up now. Um, out in Indianapolis and over 50,000 50, bricks laid on that project um, so far. And so now, you know, we're going from this transition where over the last year we were doing projects in the 10,000 bricks, 20,000 bricks, 50,000 brick range, and now this year we're doing projects that are, that are 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 bricks. Um, so these robots are going to get much, much more use over, over the coming year, year and a half. So uh, it's, been, it's been an exciting uh, transition. You can see kind of this rate of acceleration from 2014 to 2016 is the number of projects we've been on. And, and right now uh, we have machines, we've got about six machines out there. Um, some are sold uh, to distributors, some are in our rental fleet, and uh, we're actually looking to build uh, at least six more. Uh, probably this year, before the end of the year, we expect that we'll build uh, at least uh, 12 to 14 more robots, if not more. Um, so you know, the fleet will significantly grow in size this year, and uh, the number of projects we'll be on, I expect to be easily double uh, where we've been so far. So pretty exciting time, and, and I think that we really see this as the future of construction, and um, you know, as, we, as we think about the impact that the architecture community, the design community can have in the construction space, we hope that this idea of robots actually being used on job sites starts to become part of the thinking right from the beginning. And uh, you know, not only how do we leverage a bricklaying robot, but how are other robots could, how could other robots be used or other robotics or advanced manufacturing principles be used in a way to make construction more efficient? So, all the best. That was awesome. Thanks. Uh
uh, really, really appreciate everything you had to say and resonates, I think, with a lot of us here. One thing maybe you didn't have too much time to talk about is the safety uh, impact. Sure. Um, you did talk about maybe worker fatigue and worker injury, but they're still interacting with a pretty big robot that moves around with uh, probably quite a bit of momentum. And it, are there any safety concerns? Are you seeing an impact on safety or a decrease of uh, site issues? Um, it, it's probably a little early to tell kind of the overall impact on, on uh, site issues. You know, worker fatigue, we definitely hear that right away. I mean, we've got guys that at the end of the day, after working with the robot, they go home and we've had some guys tell us, you know, they love working with the robot because at the end of the day, they go home and they have energy to be able to play with their kids as opposed to going home after laying, you know, five, six, seven hundred bricks and feeling totally wiped out. And, you know, we have, we have guys that work with the machine that have shoulder injuries that, you know, are, it's like painful for them to even lift bricks, but they don't want to, they stop their career because they, that's what they've done their whole life, and so this allows them to do other things. So from that safety aspect, I think we've already heard great feedback in the industry and had really great success stories. Um, you know, the other question around designing this robot to be to really be a collaborative robot. You know, we essentially took a non-collaborative robot that's typically used on a, on a, on a uh, you know factory bolted to a concrete floor, guarded, caged, everything, and now we basically try to develop a system around it to make it a collaborative robot. And so if you look at, um, I don't know if I got any pictures, one sec. Um, well, if you look at the machine, let me jump back to the video from that background, um, and how it operates, the, uh, it, it really has a number of safety features around it. And so with this whole concept of how do we take this robot, we still have to protect the workers, so we still have to guard around the robot. But everything else around it is built in a way that makes it very easy for the guys to interact with. So if you look at it, there's a bunch of safety devices around it. We've got bumpers on it, so the guy's not looking, the machine runs into him, the machine stops, and then it trips at him, and then to get it to go again, they just hit a reset button. Um, there's guard doors that don't allow people in the workspace where the robot's working, but, they're, but the whole thing is designed so that if a guy needs to get in this space, let's say he sees something that's out of whack, he just pops that door, the robot immediately stops, everything freezes and it's completely safe. So he can then go in the workspace, do whatever he needs to do, put a brick tie in, fix a brick, you know, play with the mortar, whatever he's got to do. And as soon as he closes that door and hits the button that says I'm out of that space, now the robot can keep running. So we've, we've had to kind of build these collaborative concepts around um, traditional robotic industry safety standards. And you know, we, we, we have a consultant that comes in and certifies each machine. Um, and, you know, he certified the overall design, but then he certifies each machine to make sure we follow both RIA standards and OSHA standards for implementing robots. There's no real guidelines around implementing robots in a construction environment, so we've kind of had to make up a little bit of our own um, around you know, these multiple industries and, and really kind of bring that all together. That. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, for you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the training program? How long does it take for someone to know experience and yeah. to see? Yeah, so we rolled up this training program in June. Uh, what we call right now level one, which is basic operation of the robot, it's a three-day course. Show up, and after three days, these guys know how to set story bolts, they know how to run the robot, they know how to essentially do the map software, and they can they, by the end of the third day, they're building walls with these robots. So they're able to really operate it um, fairly easily. Now, that's the starting point. What we typically will do then is when we deliver the robot on the job site, we show up. Because there's a lot of little things that, that you know, happen on a job site that they're not going to learn in a three-day course. There's a lot of interruptions. There's a lot of um, different situations. Well, what do you do in this situation? What do you do in that situation? So we're typically on site for anywhere between a couple weeks and even longer, you know, a month or longer. Um, where our technicians will be on site supporting them and working with them. But we also have, excuse me, we also now have remote logging capabilities. So we remotely monitor these machines. So now what happens is like when these guys are running, um, we've got engineers back in the shop that are watching the machine run. They're watching the tablet, every brick that's going on the wall, they know if there's an error. So if, if uh, these guys call us up, our guys can immediately log in, see what's going on in the machine, resolve any issues, and help get them back up and running very quickly. Um, so that has been a huge boon for this transition from us to them is that they have that level of safety or knowledge in, their, in the back of their mind that says, I don't have to be a computer expert. I don't have to know how to solve all these problems. All I got to do is if something goes haywire and this robot does something that I don't understand, call up construction robotics guys, we log in, we look at it, we say, hey, this is what's going on, do this, do that. 
and then we're good to go. And the other thing that's really happened over the last couple of years is we've been able to improve robustness. So like their robot, when it crashes into something, pipe sticking out of the wall, guys not paying attention, robot crashes into it, we've been able to really develop the system that makes it very easy to recover from that situation. So in the past, I got to have to have a controls engineer there like working the actual robot to get it back out of that situation. Now we've gotten smart enough where nothing crashes, they're not paying attention. It'll chirp at them, they come over, they hit the e-stop button, hit reset, the thing comes back, sets the brick down, comes back to home, and then starts landing. And if they want to manually skip over something, they just pull up the tablet and the software and just literally click on the manual button, click on a brick, and it blue, makes it blue, and then they know that the robot's just going to skip past that brick. So it becomes very easy to interact with on the job site, and he's got to get pretty comfortable with it very quickly. So. Yeah. Um, maybe this is all <laughs> Up on this, uh, this bit about remote data collection. We talked about, I think, the gripping and data point. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, you've had any thoughts or conversations about much, much longer term other kinds of uh, outcomes of this, this whole process, this way of building, um, what sort of uh, other benefits that come out of it or other industries that come out of it. Um, I mean, we're always talking about, I think, we're always talking about that, um, you know, I, I think that on the data side, uh, you know, like I said before, we don't really know what it's going to be used for, but, but the reality is that I think that there's a very common discussion out there now um, with startups that are basically just collecting data for the construction industry, right. and this whole idea of how do we get better information, um, whether that's tracking, um, you know, the, whether it's tracking the installation, whether it's tracking an actual on-site efficiency, whether it's tracking kind of the maintenance of things over the life cycle. Um, you know, where this could eventually go, you know, if we eventually get really smart, maybe there's additional um, sensors or additional things that we're measuring in the mortar and in the brick that can start to predict premature failures. And, you know, oh, we measured this new, whatever this one parameter in this mortar and the way it was installed, and we expect that this may have an earlier failure than that, in which case we should, we should monitor this differently. So smarts like that can come come over time, but it's all, I think, part of this whole concept of big data and how we start to, you know, now have the data. Now that we're starting to get the data, as this grows and becomes mainstream in the industry over the next five, ten years, now what are we going to do with that data to, to help construction be more efficient, be smarter, so that we can understand life cycles of buildings better and maintenance of buildings and all those things. So that's my vision for how yeah, I see it going. But, something here. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was, it was awesome. Um, I, there is a kind of trend in, in the building industry that we call a prefabrication and off-site construction. So that your achievement is somehow very much advanced and then you are interested in that kind of on-site construction and replacing the, the workers. But some companies, maybe not in this country, in, in Japan, like the Sekisui Helm, they have uh, like the, the, the warehouse and then they produce like houses using like robots. It's mm -hmm. kind of similar technology. So do you think that your future, your direction, somehow more focused on the on-site construction still, or do you think there's some integration or other possibility using those kind of off-site kind of center? Yeah, um, that's a great, great question and a huge debate in the industry, <coughs> excuse me, in the industry. <coughs> um, you know, prefabrication has been around for a very long time. They've, they've, there's been fits and spurts with prefabrication over the last probably 20 years in construction. My business partner was the first to do, you know, prefabricated boxes for installation at a Syracuse University building a number of years ago, you know, first in the Syracuse area to do that. And so I think we've, we've had a lot of discussion about what prefabrication bring to the, can bring to the table. I think that my vision for the future of of where we're going and where the construction industry is going is that there will absolutely be a lot of prefabrication, but there will still be some on-site construction. You know, our intention is to leverage our, our robots and our expertise to hopefully have an impact on both of those. Um, for example, like one thing that we're talking about now is you look at our robot and what, what technology it brings to the table, the ability, one of the things I didn't really touch on that is one of our core capabilities is that you, know, you have this, this theoretical design of your wall, right? So you start with this theoretical design, but in reality, when you show up on the job site, Nothing is ever exactly as you design it in construction, right? There's always field measurements, there's always variation. So one thing we do with the robot is once we load that map into the machine, we have to go along and take measurements at certain points on that wall, and then everything in our software automatically corrects. So that the robot knows actual real dimensions to, to adjust to. So if everything has to shift by half inch or quarter inch, whatever. Um, so 
you know, when you think about prefabrication and the integration of prefabrication into on-site construction, you, you have to either find ways in your design to account for the variation on-site, or you need to control tolerances to a level that are really high so that you can actually, you know, know your stack of tolerance, know your implementation of the field is going to be successful. So there's some challenges with prefabrication. Well, where I think the future of construction can go is, is this intermingling between prefabric some prefabrication and some on-site construction. Think about manufacturing of a, of a car, right? An assembly line and a car today, when you have the final assembly line going in place, they're not you know, putting the stuffing in the seat and stitching the seat on that final assembly line. They got a whole seat assembly with a connector that they literally just set in place, boom, 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 four bolts and put a connector in place and that seat is done. Um, and so they've started to drive a lot of that pre-assembly to make final assembly more efficient. When you think about on-site construction, so much of the GC and the CM and what they're trying to control is the time on site, the time out in the environment, the schedule, getting product to their, their customer delivered faster than ever, and that's where prefabrication can be a huge benefit. But there's certain elements where prefabrication, where I think on-site construction can provide value over prefabrication. You think about a large wall like this one right here, yeah, I could break it down into prefabricated components, yeah, I could also choose like a metal panel siding, but if you want the look and the feel, and the actual value and the quality of a, of a full wall cavity veneered installation and you want it to look right, you gotta do it on site. And so I can easily see a situation in the very near future where you could have brick masonry components where I look at a building and I might have a section with a bunch of windows and I might have a big area of open brick where I wanna put a fancy design in it. And what I'll do is I'll take all those narrow piers and all that cut up brick work and I'll take, go to the job site and I'll take actual real measurements and I'll load it in my factory and this robot will build every single one of those subcomponents prefabricated in a shop. And then I'll show up on site when the weather breaks and I'll quickly install all these prefabricated small pieces and then I'll get to that big section and I'll do one on-site installation with the robot so that you get this awesome, beautiful, you know, fancy veneer built on site and all that other stuff is done prefabricated so you get the best of both worlds where now you get efficient um, results and something that looks like it was actually done on site. So, you know, where it ultimately goes, I think it's, it's uh, the industry is still trying to figure it out, but I mean, I think my vision is that you will have both in the future and, and hopefully we find the right, the right balance. Questions? Yeah, there. So, I'm a recent graduate, Master of Science Mechanical Engineering. My, or one of my interests is what technological challenges you're facing with engineering development today with this product and what needs your company or other companies in the space have for engineering development? Um, so from some of the biggest challenges with applying robots on a job site, um, the collaborative piece, right? So collaborative <coughs> robots uh, that are actually usable in construction environments is a major challenge. Um, and uh, you know, when you look at robots in general, uh, typical industrial robots are not really great or built for construction sites. They've got a very high weight to payload ratio, so you need a very heavy robot. You need a 500 pound robot to lift a 10 pound weight, which is insane, um, considering humans you know, are like the inverse of that. So, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the weight to payload ratio of what robots are out there today, I think, is a fundamental challenge that the industry faces as we look to implement more and more robots in the job site. Um, some of the collaborative aspects of how do we truly make a collaborative robot that is hardened for the environment. Um, hardened components is a major challenge that we find. You know, as we look at basic components that we're integrating with the machine, we have a requirement where everything needs to be IP65 or greater, you know, which means that it basically can be you know, uh, impervious to dust and rain and wind and snow and all these things. Well, every component on this machine has that requirement, which means that the cost is, is much higher and, the, and the, the number of components that we get to select from is much narrower. So I think building actual componentry that is designed for that environment is, is a challenge as well. You know, typically think about what other industries have had componentry that have those requirements. You're talking about aerospace and, and uh, you know, things like that where uh, typically your costs are not as uh, critical as, say, implementing uh, robotics for construction sites. So I think, you know, some of the componentry challenges uh, are, are uh, um, something that we're dealing with. And then, um, I mean, there's, there's probably a number of others, I think, that uh, dynamics of, of uh, machine learning and, and understanding from the software side, there's a number of things as well. So, hopefully, I answered your question. If not, we can always be more happy to chat more afterwards. You had a question? Um, do you think that at some point there's going to be a goal in the future to make this like a fully automated machine where it replaces laborers and 
kind of pulling those technicians? Or do you think there's some kind of beneficial factor or merit to having construction workers or, like, alongside the machines and the operations standpoint? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, we, you know, our, our vision, as we set out today, we knew that the best way to get this implemented into the industry today uh, in the short term and to help solve some of the problems was to try to take this collaborative approach, right? How do we work with the um, there are certain aspects of masonry in particular where um, it, it's really valuable having the, the people there, you know, you want them there. Uh, even just the craft of striking joints and, and dealing with some of the challenging situations, for us to solve that, from a t solve every single problem from a technology standpoint, one of two things needs, has to happen. Either one, we have to have 100% control of a vertically integrated process, meaning that from the very first time you think about designing that building, I've got to have control over what, what that design is. Every detail of that design, what the brick ties are, you know, what the building structure, all the details of all that stuff have to be completely controlled. So the building has to be designed from the very start with the robots in mind if you want to try to drive to a fully automated solution. Or you need incredibly smart robots with incredible flexibility and capability. You know, think DARPA challenges and some of the stuff that's going on with some of the most advanced robots out there that are they're trying to figure out how to you know, open doors and, and run drills. And so you know, that technology is evolving very rapidly. but um, it's going to be a little while, I think, until that technology is ready to, say, have that level of smarts. Um, I think there will be instances where, um, in the short term, uh, there's probably small situations, you know, where, whether it's housing or certain things where you can completely control the design from the beginning and you, you know, 3D printed up houses, they're doing some of that already. Um, so, you know, where, where it ultimately goes, uh, I think you're going to see a little bit of a mix. I think where our vision is is that we like the idea of having uh, this whole collaborative concept that I think there could be robots that we produce that are more fully automated, but um, I think that uh, at least in the in the near term, you know, the next five to ten years for our company, a big focus will be on how do we leverage the workers that are there um, to certain levels of automation. Some of our products are going to be very low levels of automation with assist devices, and some are going to be um, probably like Sam, or even more more automated. So, hopefully, that's a good question. I have one question. So, um, uh, are there, um, in terms of the slow robotics, uh, the climate robotics, uh, have you heard back from Masons that they would like you to implement certain things for SAM? Uh, we are constantly getting feedback. Is Masons. there something that you're working on that's really interesting that they've asked for? Um, that's a good question. Um, there are, there, there's a number of software things that we're, we're working on that, that's feedback from them. You know, one of the things that uh, we we thought about that we'd like to try to work on um, that we are getting from a feedback standpoint is so for example like our laser the way our system works is there's a laser string line that's shooting down the wall. I didn't really highlight that. But if you look at some of the videos, um, I'll play one here in the background. Can find that person. Uh -huh. Uh, and, you know, I think if you if you look at the laser string line, the way it works is that there's a story pole that's mounted to the wall, and um, so it shoots this laser down the wall. So over here, there's a story pole mounted to the wall, shooting the laser down the wall like a string line. When the robot goes to the wall, it's looking at that laser and then placing the brick, and that's how we get our correction. So as the robot, as the scaffold's moving, as the, as things are changing in space, the scaffold's tilted, the robot's leaning one way or the other. Guys loading bricks up on the scaffold, and the scaffold's shaking. When we go to that wall, we look at that laser streamline and we correct for all the movement of everything going around so that that brick can go exactly where it's supposed to go. Huge, one of our core technologies, huge advancement for us to be able to implement that. But one of the things that we've learned is that the masons, you know, when they're working the wall, they're also working in the same space, so they're blocking the laser. So we had to improve our laser to a point where, you know, if we see now, if we see that laser for a split second, we have enough information to place the brick. So that was a because in the beginning the guys would block the laser. We would, you know, the first job we were on, the guys were blocking the laser and we couldn't see it. So they'd have to stand back and well, during the whole time that we were placing that brick, which got really annoying. So we were able to evolve that technology to this point where now all they do is just show the robot the laser for a split second and then they keep doing what they're doing, which was a great advancement. But where that where we'd like to go is to not have that laser. So whether it's advanced visioning of the wall to understand how to tie that back together or another advanced laser system, we've looked at a few different options love to continue to progress that. But again, that's the type of thing that will make it a little bit easier for the masons to work with a robot, a little bit more flexible in the setup that they don't, they're not tied to this traditional story pole process. And that will also enable additional capabilities like some of the arches and the curves and things like that. So 
that is one of the things where we'd love to get to that point. We know there's feedback from the industry to get to that point, um, but it's just going to take a little bit of time, effort, partnerships with the right uh, you know, universities or companies or whatever it is, but you know, that, that's an example of, I think, a transition of where that's going. Um, and then obviously one of the other things when you think about co-robotics is we would absolutely love to get rid of all that guardian around the robot. I would love to have sensing and smarts um, where the guy can literally be working right next to the robot. When the guy, when the guy walks right next to the robot, the robot slows down or sees him there and knows he's there and knows he's, you know, not to bump into him. And if the guy puts his hand in the space, the robot stops for a second until he moves his hand. The problem is that some of the sensing sensors for that type of stuff are out there, but, but not a lot of it is robust for the outdoor environment that we're dealing with. So, again, very solvable problem, I think, with some with the right implementation, the right software, the right fundamentals, but as a startup company, it's difficult for us to apply a huge amount of money in the R&D of that because we just don't have the resources. But eventually, absolutely want to solve that and would love to, to get to that point. So, you know, to make this thing half or a third of the size that it is, uh, with no guarding and with a different uh, a laser system, that, that's going to be, I think, game changer for the number of areas you can utilize this technology going forward. Okay, thanks so much, Scott. Yeah, thank you.